want to start with a picture of Manila in the 1960s. 23 million Filipinos, um, three FM stations, all AM stations, two TV stations, uh, no social media, telephones had party lines, and that was really what it was. It was a very different time. And culturally speaking, we were like, culturally speaking, we were influenced by America. It was an aspiration to, to live in the U.S., to want to dress up like the Americans, to listen to the music without American bandstand music. That's what it used to be called, American bandstand. And we were just so enamored with things American. We had Elvis Presley of the Philippines, uh, Nils Adam of the Philippines, Pericom of the Philippines, of the Philippines syndrome, gusto gusto natin. And that was really what it was. And uh, the rich, the very rich, the Kahiro Paul is a very, very rich tradition in Iloilo, but I just used that as an example for the rich. They really wanted the American experience. I mean, full on, full on talaga. And the whole idea was to really feel the American experience. If you studied in Ateneo during that time, if you were caught speaking in Tagalog, you were fine. You were fine, really. It was a very different world. And they listened to whatever was going on in America, they listened to it here also. Pero siyempre mas matagal dahil may wala pang internet nun, no? Now, what were the, uh, you know, the not rich listening to? This is the Bakya crowd as it was called then. Why was it called Bakya? Because they were wearing Bakya. Wooden shoes, no? And uh, that, that term came from Lamberto Avellana, actually, the director, because he noticed that all of the people watching his movies were nakabakya. What were they listening to? They were listening to people like Eddie Peregrina, who was also doing American songs like Papi Love or, um, I'm playing this song. You know, stuff like that. But he was singing it with a Filipino accent. So one thing was clear. They also wanted American culture, but they wanted it friendlier. They wanted to hear the songs with an accent that they had. Hindi masyadong Arneo, hindi masyadong Aplas, di ba? But they wanted that experience. Nora Honor was also there. She was also doing the same thing. She was singing the paper roses, but she was also doing original stuff. No? So Eddie Peregrino was also doing original stuff and so was uh, Nora Honor. But one thing was clear. If you observe what was happening then, the mentality was mass followed class. If the classy people were looking to America, Massa were doing the same thing. Okay? That was the 60s. Enter the 70s. Oh my gosh. Protest. Anger. Galit na galit na mga tao. I was one of those uh, people in college during that time and the whole movement was Filipinization. We wanted things relevant. It was the age of relevance. We were angry. Angry at everything. We were angry at America, angry at uh, English and all of that. And as a songwriter then, Apo, we thought we came into it by ourselves, but so did uh, Juan de la Cruz and so did Dre Valera and all the other songwriters. We all came to the idea that we must write in Filipino. We wanted to write the soundtrack of Filipino lives because we realized that as much as we love the Beatles and as much as we love American music, they did not write it for us. We were a French market. So we wanted to write stuff for us. And that was the start of OPM. So it was a great time. And Manila Sound was born, and we had uh, Pinoy pop, jazz, folk, rock, what have you. Whatever you could think of, you could do. And that was the golden age, a mini renaissance of Philippine music. And the branch OPM was born in 1978. That was really a terrific time. And we fell in love with our music. And, that, and to this day, 70s music is being played. One thing was clear. During the 70s, bumalik na mundo. Class began to follow mass. Because we wanted, we wanted a mass audience. We wanted a mass audience. So we had to record in Tagalog. And that was really the great, great thing that happened in the 70s. Uh, enter the 80s. American Top 40 makes a big comeback in the Philippines by way of radio format. FM stations all of a sudden ad adopted 
in full the LA sound. So even the names of the disc jockeys like Trigger Man and Ricky T's and all of that, these jockeys abroad were borrowed here. So the whole thing was to sound like to sound like you're in the US. Which also meant some stations went R&B, some stations went rock and all of that. Prior to that, in the 70s, Apo, Yoyo Villame, and, and uh, Basketball Death were all played by the same disc jockey in the same show. No, no segmentation, no nothing. Now all of a sudden, everything was uh, segmentized. So, what happened there? MTV came along and that was a game changer. All of a sudden, Bad music could look good. Bad music could look good and good music could look bad, depending on the video. That's the really sad part about it. So, it was very interesting. So what was happening was, the gains that were done in the 70s were slowly disappearing because artists had to be R&B to be played, or they had to be rock. They couldn't be anything they wanted to be. It was like a straight jacket. And piracy started to come in, and that was really the dangerous part, because as we speak today, the figures of piracy is already 80%. 80%, can you imagine that? Of what? I could be earning much, much more than what I'm earning now. No? And I'm sad about that. Okay, so, enter the 90s. What happened in the 90s? The bands came in, and the bands sort of carried the flag for OPM. Why? Why was it easy for them? Because they were young, they were hungry, they were cheap, and they just wanted to rock and roll. You know? So that's what happened there. The band sort of saved it, but it never came close to what OPM should be. Now, the question is, the question is, how can OPM be world class? We have experienced being world class in two ways. Lea Salonga, Ceris Penpenko, right? But when you think about it, they were very good, but they were singing for a different market. Freddie Aguilar in the 70s came in singing in Filipino uh, with a version of Anak uh, uh, in 27 languages, but with a Tagalog version sweeping all of them all over the world. You know? So it gives us a, a paradigm of two ways to make it world class. One was Lea, one was uh, Anak. So the question is, how do other countries do it? How do other countries do it? The Brazilians come in as Brazilians. The Chinese come in as Chinese. The Japanese, the same. Bob Marley doesn't try to correct his English, his accent. He comes in as he is. You know? And that should tell us something. Ang lahi natin kamilyon. We try to erase everything about us and we come in as, okay, I'll be a good American if I'm in America. I'll be a good Japanese if I'm in Japan. So we're, we're kind of different. Okay, now look at this. Why won't it move? There you go. Think of the Filipino as both hardware and software. As hardware, we're very good. We can sing, we can do anything. We've proven it to the world. Pacquiao is great hardware. But culture is software. And the next big thing all over the world is culture. And we have to be able to present Philippine culture to the world. Now, how do we present it? We present it just as we are. When we did EDSA, we became the template of the world. And we did it spontaneously. We did it just as we are. Not trying to please anybody, but a full expression of who we are. And we did that. And the GP is the same thing. And the Bayanian is the same thing. If we tell our stories naturally, the way we are, and get out of these victim stories of how poor we are, or how kawawa naman we are, or how our women are being raped and all of that, we can tell a compelling story to the world that can put the Philippines in the map. Thank you very much. Yeah.